Bom, é, dando continuidade então a, a, aos nossos trabalhos, é, eu passo aqui a professora Vera Caran para os seus comentários. O, você vai fazer um resumo? Sim. Eu acho que então, a professora Vera Caran, então. ajeitando aqui a melhor maneira para todos. Antes de mais nada, vocês entenderam a maioria da exposição do professor Leves e do professor Marco? Então, eu acredito que a professora Vera poderia fazer a pergunta em português, quem sabe? Vocês acham? Aí o, o, o Shailan traduz e passa para os professores e vice-versa. Depois a gente pode apresentar por dentro, tá bom? É, antes de mais nada, agradecer ao Eduardo a Ana Lúcia e todos os demais colegas aqui da União Brasil pela conferência que nos convidaram a participar desse grande evento, mais um evento de força aí do programa de pós-graduação, algo que diz que vem construindo isso, esse detalhe, toda essa turma super forte aqui da Brasil. Agradecer ao professor Maicon Montel, ao professor Levinson, pela generosidade das, das suas falas e vou uh, uh, pontuar duas questões. Uh, em primeiro lugar, é em relação à fala do professor Michael. É, se o uh, enforcement dos direitos sociais não depende de, é, diretamente das cortes, nós estaríamos próximos é, das propostas do chamado constitucionalismo popular, que é, justamente é, é, re, refusa, é, recusa Uh, o jurídico de o controle de nacionalidade. Uh, segunda, nós, nós temos na Constituição brasileira um longo catálogo de direitos sociais. E nós temos um forte controle de constitucionalidade concentrado na nossa Suprema Corte. Essa é uma má combinação? E para o professor Lévin, vamos fazer a questão do professor Lévin. É, é, há, um, há um personagem da vida política brasileira que foi uh, deputado, foi ministro da Suprema Corte, foi presidente da Suprema Corte, foi ministro da Defesa do governo Lula e, na nossa, na, do meu ponto de vista, essa experiência não foi boa para o nosso constitucionalismo democrático. Porque nós, é possível no Brasil é, que é, um, um, um deputado, enfim, ou um juiz da corte, ou um membro do poder executivo, é, faça que tenha esse trânsito entre as esferas de poder. Mas, particularmente nesse exemplo, não foi saudável e o caso mais específico que pode indicar isso é a sua intervenção é, na, na, no, na ação que questionava a constitucionalidade da lei de amnistia. Eu estou me referindo ao Nelson Jobim. São essas as minhas considerações. Obrigada. 
que só essa palavra já, não sei, abre para todos? Acho que faz já se Uh, well, uh, thank you uh, for two excellent questions. Uh, I'm going to start uh, with the second question. Okay. Uh, as I understand it, uh, the question uh, is, Well, in Brazil, we have a constitution that includes a long list of social rights. Yeah. And in Brazil, we also uh, uh, we also put the STF in charge uh, of the interpretation and implementation of the constitution. And is that combination a bad idea? Um, well, it's hard for me to speak uh, Specifically about the SDF, because although I have some knowledge of some of its work, I don't, I don't have uh, a professional level sense of what should I call it, the culture uh, of the SDF. Uh, but uh, 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 let me approach the question indirectly by speaking of what we call, what we call the SCOTUS. Do you know what SCOTUS is? The SCOTUS is the Supreme Court of the United States. <laughs> we, we also sometimes disrespectfully refer to them as the Supremes. <laughs> um, uh, entrustment, entrustment of the animation, motivation, energy, uh, uh, activation, activation of constitutional social rights in the United States to the Supreme Court as, as it and its culture presently stand would be problematic. Uh, the The Supreme Court itself and the country at large, the bar, the lawyers, uh, both would have to transform their ideas of what the Supreme Court's job is. Because according to the prevailing outlook in the United States today, the Supreme Court's job is to lay down the law of the Constitution. It is to decide in a law-like manner and to then inform the country about what the Constitution prohibits, requires, there are three categories, prohibits, requires, and permits. Uh, the general attitude of the country is if you want to know what our Constitution prohibits, requires, or permits, within the area of rights enforcement, there are also I see my friend Professor Levinson sitting right next to me. There are also what we call the structural provisions, the provisions that organize the institutions and assign the competencies and the procedures. Those, those are, uh, much of that material is very much within the keeping of the Congress to decide or the President to decide. But when it comes to rights, our Supreme Court has claimed and our country by and large concedes to the Supreme Court Total command. And given the ambiguities and the debatability about the implementation of social rights uh, that both I and Professor Levinson have addressed, and that would call for a more conversational relationship as opposed to a command and control relationship between the Supreme Court, among the Supreme Court, the Congress, the President, the State Houses. Uh, what, what, 
comandos do STF. Maybe the STF is up for a weak form judicial review. That's the dialogue. That's the dialogue that Professor Nemoshi talks about. The SCOTUS is not. They're not going there anytime soon. So here, maybe we have a difference between the Brazilian situation and the Aqui pode ser que temos uma diferença da aceitação. Pode ser uma coisa. Uh, Vera's first question was related, I yes, think. As I understand it, it's this. If we say that the actual progress with the implementation of social rights depends on, is in the hands of, either popular political action, the electorate, or perhaps more plausibly, the Congress, the state legislatures, the president, the state houses, the governors in the states. If it really depends on the political <coughs> sector of our society to take these rights where we would like to see them be taken, then does that point to rejection of control by the judiciary? I wouldn't. Answer that. I would not answer that with a simple yes. Ele não dá a resposta simplesmente um sim. A primeira pergunta. For three reasons. For three reasons. First of all, um, it's not that the judiciary, by and large, is getting in the way. It's not that the judiciary is, by and large, is saying uh, no to the state when the state introduces. When the state's politicians introduce a progressive, redistributive social rights program, I don't say I don't say they never say no. And in fact, we are we were in danger uh, a year and a half ago that our Supreme Court would say no to Obamacare, and we are in danger again on a new ground with a new recently recently activated lawsuit that for a very strange reason having nothing to do with the merits of the policy of Obamacare, but really based on a technicality that five of those nine may uh, by next June or the June following say no and undo um, the entire federal governmental health care support apparatus as it now exists in the United States. It could happen. But the main problem, I think, hasn't been that judiciaries have gotten in the way. The problem comes with relying on the judiciary to be the principal energizer and director of the at the federal level. But, but as Professor Levinson has so nicely pointed out, it can really work, and this is the third reason, it can really work better if you have a judicial body that has developed the willingness and the skill to engage in give and take with the Congress so that the court can act as a job, the court can act as a critic, but without the court, without the court feeling that once it enters the case at all, it must take over the whole case entirely and figure out for the government what the policy should be. The, the voting case that Professor, that Professor Levinson began with was easy. All the court had to do was to say you cannot charge people to vote. There was no chance that the state was not going to have elections anymore. <laughs> so a simple negative decree, a simple, a simple negative judicial order was all it took. In San Antonio, uh, Edgewood and Alamo Heights, 
The Supreme Court could have said to Texas, you must find a different way of paying for primary education and of distributing the resources. This way, no, negative. But the way our Supreme Court works, they would, had they gone that far, have felt very uneasy if they had just stopped and said, you go back, you redesign it, then you come back and tell us what you've done, and we'll tell you whether it's okay. The Texas Supreme Court was prepared to do that. Our Supreme Court of the United States has not got the skills, the experience, or the support facility to engage in that kind of activity. So the state national difference here is really uh, quite significant. Uh, before directly answering the question, there was, there was one thing I forgot to say with regard, perhaps, to comparing the United States Supreme Court and the Brazilian Supreme Court. The current United States Supreme Court hears about 75 cases a year. Uh, there are a total of 8,000 petitions but quite frankly, I think most of them are de facto decided by clerks who say probably correctly there's no reason to take this case. The Supreme Court has complete, almost complete control over its own jurisdiction. Whereas I've been told that the Brazilian Supreme Court or Brazilian courts more generally have 100,000 cases on medical care alone. And this makes, incidentally, all the more exceptional or interesting the fact that there is so relatively little dialogue between the U.S. Supreme Court because dialogue does require, between the court and other institutions, because dialogue does require repeated cases. That is, the court rules, the legislature, the executive responds, the court responds. Whereas in many important issues, the court will offer a decision once every five or eight or even ten years, uh, they're called. You know, it's not only SCOTUS or the Supremes, but also at times the Delphic Oracles, <laughs> who will issue a very abstract opinion and then leave it to other courts or legislatures to make sense of it, and then perhaps five or six years later or longer to take a similar case. But to get to the question, the devil is in the details. There are certainly people I would not want to be on any court, let alone the Supreme Court. That being said, it's the case that and I'm thinking now of the only system I know, which is the American system, that every member of the current Supreme Court, even if they've not held elected office, have backgrounds. And with one exception, a friend and colleague, uh, Professor Michaelman's, Justice Stephen Breyer, Justice Breyer is the only member of the nine-person court who has ever spent what might be called quality time on Capitol Hill working with the National Congress. And this makes a difference. He is the only member of the Supreme Court, I think, who has genuine regard 
for Cosmos. Sometimes too much regard. <laughs> that being said, he views Congress with some genuine affection. The other members of the U.S. Supreme Court, almost all of them, not all, but almost all of them, have had some executive branch experience, often in the United States Department of Justice, where, frankly, they pick up an executive branch orientation. So to the extent that some of our most important issues are over presidential power, national security, most of the court basically loves executive power because that's where they come out. It's also the case that especially the lower courts, but even a bit the Supreme Court, is the judges are very likely to have been prosecutors and rarely likely to defend ordinary people charged with what might, one might call ordinary crime instead of white collar crime. The last member of the United States Supreme Court, I'm quite confident, who has ever visited a jail or a prison to talk to his client, in this case, was Justice Thurgood Marshall, <laughs> who retired from the court 25 years ago. And quite frankly, given contemporary American politics, it's almost impossible to imagine a president appointing anyone to the Supreme Court who really has fought for the rights of criminal defendants. The most explosive topic would be, for example, to have been an attorney for one of the detainees in Guantanamo. It is impossible to imagine appointing any of these truly outstanding lawyers. So now, turning to your particular example, I know nothing about this justice. Perhaps he was not the best appointee. That being said, I wish there were more people on the federal judiciary who had a wide range of experience. And even on the amnesty issue, I will confess to being genuinely torn. Professor Michael has spent a lot of time in South Africa. Um, I've been there once in a conference on the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in which amnesty was the key question. It's a genuine, deep political problem as to what extent justice should be served, which means people should pay in essence for their sins, for their crimes, for their misdeeds. And to what extent one makes a decision to move forward by drawing a curtain over the past. Within the United States, I am very, very critical of President Obama. I think he behaved wrongly in not moving to prosecute any of the people who engaged in torture during the Iraq war and the so-called war on terror. I supported President Obama twice. And 
the argument he makes is not a stupid argument. It is an argument that had these officials, and it would not have been enough to go after some low-level people. I personally would have liked to have seen the Secretary of Defense, Donald Rumsfeld, and the Vice President, Dick Cheney, go to jail. That being said, I concede the merits of an argument saying that that would have further torn an already highly polarized country apart. Did he do the right thing? I'm, in, I'm still inclined to say no, because basically everybody got the equivalent of amnesty without his actually taking responsibility for it. I, had, I would have been much more sympathetic had he given a speech and said, I'm making a conscious decision to grant amnesty to people who behaved criminally because the needs of the country require it. So when one gets to these genuinely deep political issues, it remains the case that, let's assume a nine-person court, because that's the one I know, that I'm still receptive to the idea that at least one or two people of that court should have a certain level of political experience. And if a former Secretary of Defense says they're all honorable patriots, let them go. I will rely on the other seven justices to say that's not a stupid argument, but the rule of law or recognition of international norms requires that not everybody go free and that some people be held to account. But as I say, I think these are really serious arguments. Um, the whole thing, I mean, I, I read an article, you can tell me if there's any merit to it, that members of the Brazilian military were being sent to the Amazon because of fears that, that the Amazon would be vulnerable to certain kinds of foreign attacks. I have no idea whether this is true or not. But obviously, national security is an issue that relates to every serious country. And I can tell you, um, many, of many of the national security decisions in the Supreme Court um, are written by people who at a certain level just don't know much about what they're talking about. Quem tem perguntas na plateia? Acho que o Malícia se inscreveu primeiro, hein? Isso, vocês podem fazer também que eu não esqueci. Você tem que falar.